how much native plants are really a big part of this picture, uh, we think, and uh, we really would love to understand more about uh, how much they're playing. But most of you have probably heard about some of our recent work that came out in the fall, I guess now in science, talking about 3 billion birds lost in North America. And so I'll talk, somehow it's not advancing. It's, it's not advancing. There it is, okay. okay. I'll talk primarily about um, that paper. And you should know this was a, an effort by not myself at all, but by, not just by myself, but by a large group of folks from the US and Canada, from federal agencies, from uh, uh, nonprofits, from universities, uh, statistical gurus, as well as uh, folks that are um, more field ecology types, um, and as well as thousands and thousands of citizen scientists that have contributed data and time to this effort going back to 1970. So they are probably the real uh, folks that deserve all the credit on this on this effort. And I'll talk about them in just in just a minute. This is a, a Rufus hummingbird, uh, one of the species that's declining. Now the decline of birds in North America is unfortunately not a new thing. It's an old thing, in fact. And um, Silent Spring and, and what we learned from DDT uh, is probably one of the first real examples of where we were alarmed about the declines of birds. And this book came out in the early 1960s. Of course, most of us are familiar with this, authored by Rachel Carson. But we knew about the DDT impacts back to the 1940s. In fact, lots of birds were being found in a variety of different states, and uh, it was determined to be DDT, but it wasn't until really Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring that got everyone's um, uh, alarm and it started to move up the ranks. And it was Wisconsin where it was eventually banned and then it was a federal ban in the early 1970s. But Rachel Carson spent a lot of time at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. And uh, with, time, with time with this guy, Chan Robbins, who was one of my heroes. Chan uh, at the time was one of the first ornithologists at Patuxent and Rachel Carson and he apparently were talking and it was about the importance of monitoring and the importance of having monitoring schemes in place so we understand how if something like a DDT all of a sudden pops in and we understand what the impact's gonna be because understanding those impacts were sort of critical to eventually reversing those impacts. So Chan Robbins put into place the North American breeding bird survey routes and those survey routes have continued since the 1960s until today and are still, I think one of the best examples of a monitoring scheme that occurred not only in the US and now not only in Canada, but they're also expanding into Mexico. And there are other monitoring schemes around the world that have been modeled after the BBS. There's also been other assessments using primarily the BB, BBS data, the Breeding Bird Survey data that uh, have come out in something we're calling the state of the birds, 2014 in particular, but they've been coming out almost every year, every two years. I don't know if you all have something called the state of the plants, mm -hmm. um, but you know, these are, these are things that happen on an annual basis and sometimes biannual, as I said, that really get people's attention if they're, if they're publicized correctly. But even in here, we talked about not individual species, not loss, but just trends of birds lumped by habitats, by broad biomes. And you'll see in this, in this graph in 2014, only wetland birds were showing a broad uh, increase or, or at least stable. And we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a little bit. But what we didn't really know was at the time, even then, and up until this paper two years ago before we started working at it, on it, were, was the overall net, was there an overall net decline in birds or was the increase in water birds compensating for the loss of other birds? So do we generally have the same number of birds despite the trends? So we decided to do the most comprehensive, the most thorough assessment of how many birds there were and what the loss were of birds using any data available. So that incorporated not just breeding bird survey data, but, crisp, but also Christmas bird count data and several more organized professional counts organized by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Water Bird Surveys, Canadian Wildlife Service, and also some shorebird counts that are out there. Seabirds are pretty much not included in these, um, in these counts. So we estimated population trends, uh, used a variety of uh, ways to estimate population size, and we put these together into a sort of hierarchical model of population change by species. We did this for 529 species uh, across the U.S. and Canada. But we didn't stop there. We also decided to use a totally different network, totally independent network, that being the NEXRAD radar system. 
So next ride radars are located across the US fairly systematically. I'll show you another map that has them uh, um, distributed across the US. And you can see a picture of one on the right, but these are meant to detect things in the sky, like rain, like sleet. But it turns out they also detect bats, insects, and birds moving across. And you can see on this image, this, this animation, there's a strip of going from the south to the north, it's about to come back in as this recycles, that reddish green, that's a weather front. But each of those other blue, greenish things that come around in circles, that's all of a sudden blast, those are birds moving through the sky um, that are picked up as they move through the radii of these next red radar. And you can actually, these are, there's the dots, each of those measure, this is the sort of the um, Krieged map of spring migration in the fall and going into, in the spring, going into April, and then as it intensifies in, in May, um, you can see we're basically documented in cumulative amount of migration traffic, because most of these birds are migrating at night, but this isn't just, just at night, this is day and night. You can see the direction, and then you can also do some statistics to come up with the overall avian biomass that's moving through the sky. And because the National Weather Service, unlike, unlike in most countries, actually stores these data, we can actually go back in time, at least the last 10 years, and look at how the biomass of birds in the sky has changed over 10 years, and use this as an independent way to assess how our on-the-ground surveys compare to our aerial surveys, which is a pretty powerful thing. The thing we can't do is separate species. So there's no species level data here, which is frustrating, but it's still great to have this other thing, this other assessment that allows us to sort of compare to our other data. So let's look at the, at the results. So in general, you probably heard this before, but our, in general, we found a net population change from 1970 to 2017 of close to 3 billion birds, 2.9 billion birds since, since 1970. That puts the overall biomass of birds and, or sorry, the overall number of birds in 1970 around 10 billion. Uh, that's the, that's the breeding, pre-breeding standing biomass. And so that's about a 30% loss of abundance across North America. And that's 303 of about 529 species, or 57% of species in some form of significant decline. We can separate this by species, we can separate it by biome, and you can see that grassland species, that's both eastern and western grassland species, are definitely taking it on the chin the most. Next is boreal forest, western forest, arctic tundra. You can, you can see the, the figure going all the way up to arid lands and then coastal birds. And wetland birds, not necessarily the herons and egrets, mainly waterfowl, uh, are the species that are, are doing, doing the best. And again, there's, there's reasons for that. But we see a 13% increase among wetland birds. There's winners and losers. The red uh, diagram there, that's all the, the losers, sparrows, wood warblers, blackbirds, sparrow, um, swallows, nightjars, you can see. And then there's some species that have done well, ducks and geese, uh, turkeys, raptors, gnat catchers, and then red-eyed vireo. And the vireos in general are this one group we're still scratching our head over, are one group that has definitely increased um, significantly, almost exponentially. The most disturbing thing to many of us was the loss of common species. These are species that we grew up with um, and now are disappearing before our very eyes. We, we saw their decline. Things like horned lark, junco, savannah sparrow, red-winged blackbird. And then even the non-native species are showing significant declines. House sparrow, starling, rock pigeon. Um, and this is, this, is, this is quite disturbing to us. To us, this suggests that there are broad-scale drivers here. And I'll emphasize this more later, and we'll talk about this, but we don't know the specific causes of decline for most of these, most of these species. So it's a broad scale decline of 3 billion birds, and even common species, even non-native species, are showing declines. So what about our next rad radar? Well, you can see in general, the red dots are where we see really significant, strong declines in bird biomass from 2007 to 2017. There generally is an east versus west pattern here. Um, and, uh, but the blue is, is where there are definitely some positive trends. Let's see. So we combine trend versus biomass passage. And in general, overall, 
Eastern, Mississippi, and Atlantic flyaways, but also Central significantly showed declines, especially in the Atlantic and Mississippi. Total decline is about 13.6%, an annual rate of decline of 1.5% per year. And this actually corresponds quite well with the entirely independent on the ground surveys that we did. We just can't, again, can't compare these data to species. But in general, two independent measures are showing declines of birds. Why does this matter? Well, I think all of us in this room understand that this matters for lots of reasons. Um, first of all, species decline before they become endangered or go extinct. We, as, an, as a former federal agent, uh, but also as a concerned citizen and, and biodiversity buff, um, don't want things to get listed, don't want things to be put on T&E, because then it costs us hundreds of, mil hundreds of millions of dollars per species. We should be acting as these warnings come in, as they're starting to decline. Species decline before they go extinct. We need to act. There's all sorts of concerns here, one of which is that we're losing ecosystem integrity, we're losing ecosystem services. But to me, I don't think that should be the trigger. Just by losing these incredible species, we're losing priceless components of our ecosystems, just like we would if we were losing a Monet or losing a Picasso from a, from a museum. We have a responsibility to protect not only these species, but also their behaviors, like this mass spectacle of, or this spectacle of mass migration that we're, we're losing. And this is all consistent. This, is, this should not be new to anybody on the phone. Biodiversity is declining globally. We're seeing it in plants. We're seeing it in insects. We're seeing it in amphibians. It's, it's just um, consistent with other things that we're seeing. And frankly, when you fly across the United States, not anything any of us will be doing anytime soon, unfortunately, um, it, it, you see the land use change. You see how we've influenced the face of the earth. The drivers of these declines, we, we know that habitat loss, agricultural intensification, urban sprawl, tropical deforestation, these are most likely the biggest drivers here, but they're not the only drivers. We know, and this is, these are from analyses that I've done with, with postdoc Scott Loss and a colleague, Tom Will, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, there's a variety of human-caused bird mortality agents. Cats are responsible for taking out 1.3 to 4 billion birds a year in the US alone. Windows take out between 200 to 300 uh, million birds, and towers take out more, 10 to 20 million birds a year. But there are multiple and interacting threats that are going to be exacerbated by climate change in the future. The days of a single cause like DDT are most likely over. Now we're talking about habitat loss, interacting with cats, interacting with climate change. And what about plant origin? What about exotic or non-native plants? and what this does to the overall ecosystem integrity. Well, we started working on this very question about 10 years ago um, in uh, some of our study sites um, in the DC area. This is a project that Doug Talame and I got funded through NSF and found an incredible graduate student, uh, Desiree Narango, who's now doing a postdoc up at, um, US, uh, at UMass and US Forest Service. We knew in general that non-native plants support lower herbivory, diversity, fewer insect species, fewer specialists. Um, but we, we didn't have a lot of data on this, but we decided to start collecting data. Doug and his colleagues have been doing this for a while. He um, um, has shown that when you look at the number of caterpillar species on introduced versus native plants, there are striking differences that are occurring there, um, in part because the introduced plants that we have here are selected to um, be pest-free. Um, they aren't often brought with their pests, and if they are, their pests really become pests. Um, so uh, there are just fundamental differences, and those insects in those plants are really important for higher order, uh, higher orders in, in the various food webs. So we asked the question, how do exotic plants affect the tritrophic relationships that occur between plants, insects, and birds? In general, we proposed and predicted that food availability in the form of caterpillars was really important in driving consumer behavioral decisions, largely Carolina chickadees. That is their breeding success, their foraging success. And so I'll talk about that now. I'll, I'll dive down a little bit deeper now into this, this part of our, our discussion. Um, Carolina chickadee is a cavity nesting species. Uh, black cap chickadee is uh, an equivalent in some places. And a lot of chickadees across the US, whether it's a mountain chickadee or a boreal chickadee, many of these are um, uh, insectivorous during the breeding season. 
uh, not as urban adapted as the Carolina and black cap, but these are particularly urban adapted. So they're, uh, and they're really, really specialize on lepidopter and larvae during, during the uh, breeding season. We used a program that I started in 1999 called Neighborhood Nest Watch, where we go into people's yards. We are focusing on sort of residential habitats uh, across urban, suburban, rural landscapes. We're now in seven different cities across from Springfield, Mass, all the way down to Gainesville, Florida, out to Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, but we're really big in the DC Baltimore area. We were up to about 200 different homes at one point, but we go in people's yards with their help. We catch birds, we color ban birds, and we teach people how to watch color banded birds and they keep a tab, they keep tabs on and enter this data electronically, how often they see those color banded birds. And, and because they're individually marked at that point. But these, these um, color banded birds provide a connection to their species in their yard that they didn't have before. And once you actually provide that personal link there, it, when we quantify this, it actually provides a much greater connection to folks uh, and, their, and their species. But there's lots of other things we can do in their yard because that provides us with access to their properties. So we can do breeding bird survey point counts. We can count the, uh, um, do entire counts and surveys of all the plants they have in the yards, caterpillar counts. We do experiments, we do all, they, they find nests and record reproductive success, all sorts of things. So in some of the cases they help us, in some other cases we just go into the yards and do these sorts of things. So one of the things that primarily Desiree did was go into their, each of their yards and, and identify 16 random trees per site and measure caterpillar availability, whether it was an exotic or introduced species or a native species. And she looked at how caterpillar abundance varied our uh, lepidopteran diversity varied um, with tree species. And you can see right here that lepidopteran diversity went way up for native versus exotic species, which isn't, shouldn't be surprising, but it's nice to have those data. This was in this case was black cherry and Japanese cherry. So it's interesting that on a congener species, but an introduced or exotic congener, you still have um, some diversity, but nowhere near the diversity that you find on, on, the, uh, on the native cherry. So then we asked, does the proportion of exotic plants predict chickadee, just their occupancy, their presence and absence, and their breeding? And we used um, eye tree plots to quantify the tree communities on everybody's yards. And basically, you know, sort of asked this question, is all of suburbia, that's a, a phrase that this guy John Marsla from UW uh, came up with, the same? And it turns out it's not. And that's, that's one of the challenges with residential areas is that everybody is managing their property very, very differently. So that has huge impacts on biodiversity in these communities, an impact that we don't really understand. But in general, the diversity of plants were, was quite high. It was about 29 plus or minus 10 plants per site. The range was between 12 and 58 plant taxa. And the proportion exotic ranged from one to 99%. So we had a pretty good uh, range of, of uh, sites to work with here to, to look at these patterns. What we found on the x-axis here is native towards the origin and more and more exotic towards like ginkgo um, uh, up on the uh, x-axis. And on the y-axis was the probability of chickadee nesting. And you can see as you became more and more exotic, chickadee nesting actually went to zero. They, they weren't even, they, they weren't nesting at all. They were present, but they wouldn't even nest as the proportion of exotic plant species went up on those sites. So then we asked, does the proportion of exotic plants predict where these birds forage? So we followed these color banded nestings and nest tending ad adults. And we found all the trees they were foraging in and quantified percent foraging uh, and their selection towards different sites. And you can see, uh, this is one of Desiree's maps here. In general, they focus the most on species like American elm, oaks, all the oaks, black cherry. These are the species that have the highest diversity of insects. Um, we knew this before, but the chickadees pretty much just told us, told us that pattern. So they preferred um, species that were, or, or sites that had very few exotic species and uh, avoided sites that um, were dominated by exotic or introduced species. Again, consistent with, with our predictions about the impacts of introduced or exotic plants. So that was about presence, absence, and foraging. But to what degree do these data, do native versus non-native plants really influence population processes at higher trophic levels? So Desiree measured reproduction, 
in uh, nest boxes, adult survival, and juvenile survival by actually putting radio transmitters on young and looking at daily survival. And this, by doing this, you can actually measure overall population growth. Um, so basically ask the question, how does the abundance of non-native plants influence reproductive success of Carolina chickadees? And in general, as you look at the number of young fledged on the y-axis against the percent non-native trees, as you get more and more non-natives, you see a decline in reproductive success, a significant decline, almost a, a curvilinear, but an exponential decline in reproductive success, in part because there's just not enough food in these sites. Interestingly, there's no cost to survival <clears throat> of adults across this landscape, which isn't all that sur surprising because this is, um, these birds are probably moving around quite a bit and these sites are, they may be filled in again, but um, it's primarily in reproduction. So what the interesting thing is when we built this model and we looked at percent non-native on the x-axis and lambda, which is population growth on the y-axis, if you look at this line, and this dotted line is where it needs to be, it needs to be zero or above zero um, in order for Lambda to be predicting that sites would be replacing themselves in numbers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I may have butchered that a little bit. But basically what this says, do, do you guys, do, I wonder if they see my arrow on, do you see this on here? At about 30%. Yeah, yes, we can see it. You can see it, okay. So at about 25, when you consider the uncertainty around this line, at around 25 or 30 percent, sites with greater than 30 percent non-native plants are basically reproductive sinks for Carolina chickadees. That means they're not reproducing enough young on those sites to maintain their population size. And so that's a real solid number that we are now, we've now been putting out there to actually recommend what the limits need to be in terms of your exotic plants. You don't want to go over 30%. Otherwise, your site, as far as chickadees go, will probably be a sink, but we argue probably for a variety of species. So the take-home message here is <clears throat> exotic trees support fewer food items and reduce territory quality for both breeding and foraging chickadees, at least during the breeding season. Sites dominated with exotic trees are reproductive sinks. And if we want to support avian biodiversity, homeowners should plant more than 30% native insect producing tree species uh, in urban, suburban, and rural areas. And we think this applies to other bird species as well. The other thing I want to say is that this is a tremendous problem when you look at what the horticultural industry has really done across the United States. They've literally transformed the face of the United States in urban, suburban areas, as have cities, as have, as have uh, counties. Um, I think this is changing in some areas, but it's not changing as rapidly as it should be when it comes to making recommendations about trees that support really important invertebrate communities. And that's how we need to be thinking about this. There's more and more data coming out on this. So, you know, relative to the 3 billion birds loss, there's no question. This is one of those multiple and interacting effects that are probably, in, you know, important drivers of these declines. Uh, and it's just another indication of how we're slowly eroding the overall ecosystem integrity that's important for these entire communities, not to mention the impacts on native plant species themselves. So are there reasons for help? Yeah, there are reasons for hope. Conservation works. Bird populations are resistant. When we remove DDT, bald eagles, peregrine falcons, <clears throat> uh, uh, brown pelicans, ospreys, all these species rebound. rebound. I see bald eagles almost on a daily basis. I saw a peregrine falcon driving into this, this meeting today in Crystal City, flying above the buildings. The, they're definitely resilient. Most species are resilient until they go extinct or until they get so low in population size that it becomes a problem. Conservation works. Hunters raise their voices about wetland destruction. And that's one of the reasons water birds are doing so well is because of this relationship that waterfowl and hunting has had on conservation. And that has worked. So lots of areas have been put aside and protected. Now we have to expand this, this concept, this idea, out to other portions of biodiversity that we're trying to save, mm -hmm. whether it's plants, salamanders, non-game birds, whatever it happens to be. These are things that are all important to us. The other thing is that this, got, this paper got huge attention. So that suggests that people do care, that people do want to see this, that 
that people do want to read about this. So that we did a lot of, we put a lot of effort into the PR behind this. And in any of the science we do, one of the things I tell all my students that once the paper's published, that's when the science, that's when the, the work really begins to get that message out there. We have to do more than just the science. We have to do more than just the publications. <clears throat> we have to publicize. We need to put this information into a parlance that anybody can understand, the non-biologist. We should challenge ourselves all the time why these things matter for us, why they matter for future generations. This is all critical, whether it's birds or it's trilliums. It doesn't matter. Um, again, it received huge response. It's one of the top papers that's ever, the top papers to receive the, the sort of public response on altmetric. Um, it, we had an um, op-ed in the New York Times. There was an op-ed in the Financial Times. There have been numerous uh, comic strips that have come out of this. It hits, it's definitely hit uh, contemporary uh, press. So what other things can, can we do? Well, there's lots of things we can do. Again, it's all about the press, dynamic uh, public, public publication of this um, and getting the word out there, making windows safer in day and night. We have to stop building buildings full of glass. Uh, and so uh, there's definitely efforts there. We need to keep cats indoor. Cats by far are one of the biggest anthropogenic threats uh, that are out there. It's something I've spent a lot of time working on and there's, there's solutions there, some of which are putting cats in catios, putting cats on leashes. But so one solution that's not effective is trap, neuter, return. It's just not effective. They keep hunting. Yeah. yeah, they keep hunting. They keep spreading disease. We need to reduce our lawn. We need to plant natives. We need to change that entire mindset of horticultural industry, whether that's people that uh, corporations selling plants at Home Depots and Lowe's to the nurseries that are out there. We need to really emphasize this in ways that we haven't done before um, and continue to push for reducing lawns and fertilizers and pesticides. <clears throat> um, Yep, just said that. Reducing pests. This idea of using pesticides is just crazy. We don't know to what degree neonicotinoids are actually influencing uh, bird numbers, <clears throat> but we think it's quite significant. It's just a hard thing to really demonstrate. Other things you can do is choose foods that are grown in habitat-friendly ways. Bird, Smithsonian bird-friendly coffee, something that I um, promoted and built for, for several years. It's, you know, coffee can be grown in both a dense forest canopy or it can be grown in a sun monoculture. Well, you can choose to drink Smithsonian bird friendly coffee you, or you can choose to drink coffee that's, that supports open monoculture. And um, that's true for a lot of products out there. You just need to read some of the details before you assume that Rainforest Alliance is getting behind something that truly is good for habitat because in many cases it isn't. So you just have to be careful. And protect our planet from plastics, another obvious thing that we need to do, whether it's microplastics or large plastics, we do have to eliminate plastics and get a better understanding of what we can recycle and what we can't recycle. We know that recycling is just not the answer. It's about reducing the amount of waste that we have, the amount of waste that we use. Um, this is something that's been in the press for the last six months, and it's really taught us a lot about you know, what those recycling signs mean and the fact that it really is about just using less or reusing. Watch birds, take people out to go on plant walks, get people involved in nature. Ultimately, this is something that we really need to do. In this case, I'm, I'm pitching eBird, but there, I'm sure you all have comparable things to get people out there and combine these things. Sometimes it's birding and dragonflies and plants, but getting people in nature to, to appreciate it more is half the battle in my opinion. Um, it's a real important thing we can do. But those are just the local things. There are some much larger things that we need to start uh, changing, broad scale changing. One of the things that's that's happening that could be transformational is Recovering America's Wildlife Act that's going to be putting a lot of money back into states, $1.3 billion per, per year if it's approved. Um, there are some really exciting things that could happen. We need to make sure this money gets to where it's needed um, and not filtered off into a variety of uh, unfortunate things, but this is something that could really change the game. And there are a variety of things out there that are in place to protect land. We need to make sure we support all of these joint ventures, land trusts, uh, a variety of things. And unfortunately, things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act have been you know, under major attack in this current administration. And we need to make sure to fight back 
but also use this as an opportunity to become a force for birds and nature, to get the word out there about why that matters and why that's a problem. And also view this as a moment in time for conservation, that maybe the MBTA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and other things that have been out there to supposedly protect birds, we have to recognize that these things, frankly, aren't working. They aren't working, not because they're too harsh on corporations, but for the mere fact that we're still losing 3 billion birds, that plants are continuing to disappear, that amphibians are continuing to disappear, despite the fact that we've got the endangered species. I'm not saying that the Endangered Species Act is not critical, it is critical, but whatever we have here, it's not working. We don't have enough. So I think we need to view this, 2020, it's a super year for a lot of reasons, from setting our sustainability standards, for reimagining re how we protect biodiversity. So this is, the, this is the decade that really is going to matter, and we need to take advantage of this, especially if there's going to be a transition in the near future. That's all I had to say. I'd gladly take some questions. Thank you. Yeah, Pete, this, yeah oh. thanks. That, that was great. Peggy, can you hold on this one? Okay. You're the only person I wasn't able to mute. I don't know what your, what your magic <laughs> is. But, um, we do. <laughs> There's lots of people that have said that for years, Anne. <laughs> Sorry, you want to mute me? Do you want me to mute? No, 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 you don't have to. There hasn't been any reading, so we're good. But we did have a couple of questions come in on the chat first. So if you want okay. to be waiting just a minute. Um, so this, it seems like it's the meeting of Peters because um, we, our speaker is Pete. Our first question is from Peter Bowman, and he asked, it, this was back to your slide about the percentage of native and non-native species, and he said, shouldn't that number be homeowners should plant greater than 70% native species, given that an exotic abundance of greater than 30% is impeding reproductive? That is what, it, that is what it should be. That, did I, was that written wrong on the slide? Should be 70% or more native. The slide was demonstrating where what the tipping point was That's for right. the non-native. That's right. But then later, a couple slides later, when you talked about native planting, native insect producing okay. tree species, it, I did see it written somewhere else it where wrong. it had okay. to be more than 70%. Yeah, it has so, to be more than 70% yeah. native species. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay. Thank you. And then the next question, also from Pete, Peter Vadas. He said, in cat predator research, is there a distinction made between urban cats versus rural feral cats? And if one group is worse than another? Yeah, Peter. So there, we do make distinctions between owned cats that are let outside and unowned cats that are outside, not between rural and urban. Mm -hmm. And there is a distinction in terms of the amount of mortality that we've documented and quantified from owned cats versus unowned cats. Uh, owned cats typically take about a, th they're responsible for about a third of the predation that unowned cats are, but they still are responsible for a lot of kills. Um, and and uh, what else do I want to say about that? Um, cats, your owned cats bring in only about a third of what they kill, but because they are fed, they, they don't kill as much, but they still kill a lot. And there was just a study that came out today uh, that estimates that cats, Outdoor cats kill between four and 10 times the number of animals than an equivalent native species kills in that same ecosystem. In part because their densities are so high, but because they kill for lots of other reasons. That was yeah. a paper that just came out today in animal conservation. Huh. Interesting. So it's owned versus unowned, and unowned cats are definitely uh, more significant than owned, but owned are still a huge problem. Yeah. And with cats, and I've written a book on this, and I'll, I'll pitch, and my book's called Cat Wars, The Devastating Consequences of a Cuddly Killer. Uh, it goes through all this. But it's, uh, cats are a problem outside, not just because of their predation, but also because of the diseases they spread. And there's just, they catch all sorts of diseases outside. They get killed by cars, they get killed by predators. There's just nothing good. It's impossible to defend this idea that cats should be outside. It, it's a crazy thing. The main thing it boils down to is whether or not people accept that the only alternative here in many of these cases, I mean, adoption is one of the alternatives, but euthanasia is, has to be on the table. And that's where it's, it's a kill versus no kill sort of an argument. Got it. Okay. Um, so Peggy, over to you. 
Okay, I unmuted myself. So um, I'm wondering about the recovery, Recovering American Wildlife Act, and does the Wildlife Act, I mean, does the definition of wildlife include plants, A, and if not, it should, and um, as we've seen with the state wildlife action plans, yep. it is very difficult to get plants funded through those, and so with all of this research, getting more money for plants is also going to be um, beneficial, as we all know, to the birds and the rest of the wildlife. But the American public doesn't get that. And so I think that there needs to be either um, we need plants need to be included. And if not, um, we need to have another act that is recovering American forests and range and grasslands and whatever else. Because we, when we compete for for dollars in terms of endangered species, sixty percent of the act are plants. Two per, less than two percent of the money goes to plants, and we all know that well, and we experience it in every realm of biology, politics, um, you name it. I we've been fighting the seed industry for years over why we, a federal government agency, wants natives. And we're still getting pushback. So if we can't get it <laughs> and be at the same level for the plants of this country as we are for the birds and the other wildlife, it's not going to help the wildlife because we don't, we're, not, we're not even included in the habitat restoration. We got... I keep telling people it's like, you know, asking my dentist to do my heart surgery if I ever needed it. You know, you don't you you got to bring the botanist and the and the plant ecologist into the game and we are not brought into the game on many different levels. So I just I want I I want to put my hand out to you for this cuz I think it's really great. I also want to put my hand out and say I want to work with you to bring it together in some very real way because we haven't been able to do it by ourselves. Peggy, you mean to tell me you're arguing that plants matter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's insane. I, I know, I know, it, it is. So I don't, but I, I can't, I don't know. I mean, this, this is to fund the state wildlife action plans and I don't know who, who involved in this group is a lobbyist or who your organizations are. This is National Wildlife Federation. This is the American Bird Conservancy. This is the Wildlife Society. Afua. These are, these are the, it's AFWA. Mm -hmm. It's, these are the groups, AFWA, exactly. It is AFWA. It is. It, yeah. And it, these are, these are the groups who are out there promoting RAWA. They're the ones pounding the pavement on the hill, getting people in the house, the reps, behind this. But they need to hear from people like you. They do. I gave this talk. I gave this 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 very talk. The plant message. Because yeah. but common you know, but people don't I, understand. And I talk about the entire ecosystem issue. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. People don't get it. That but I would say, well, you know, there needs to be somebody talking to AFWA and yeah. saying, there is. there is. Okay. So, so we... Um, well, can I just say I've talked to AFWA for 35 of my 40 years career? 35 of the 40 years that I've been on this in D.C. and working the, the system, I have been talking. And I hate to say it, but it is when there's money, they don't want to split the pie. Well, and that's the simple yeah. truth. You look at any of our federal government agencies, and what we end up having is 20, 20 times more wildlifers than we do botanists and plant ecologists when in reality what we are to be taking care of in these agencies is the land and the land is the habitat and yet i've been told stop saying we need so many more botanists we don't need botanists and you know i mean honest to god pete i'm with you but nobody's listening to us afla or any of the other industries 
whether it's horticulture, whether it's it's agriculture, they it is the bottom line is money, and the pie can only be split so many ways. So we've got to figure out how to make it work for them in a monetary way to work for us in a nature way. <laughs> That's all I can, and I haven't figured it out. So I'm happy to put my brain together with you because I think we are seeing the collapse. <laughs> And that's a very, sorry, I'm being very sort of dramatic, but it's it's the way I feel about it. So um, this is Anne from NatureServe. And in, in terms of the RAWA that is the uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act that is in Congress now, if you are interested in um, working with a group of people um, doing our best to incorporate plants and we're not going to change the language of the bill this go round, but um, thinking of other ways to collaborate um, and work together, um, just let me know and Emily Robertson because we are um, having open dialogue with AFWA and NWF and others. Um, and I, I have to say, just I was going to say this till later, but related to this, I just got back from SEPCON, the Southeastern Partners in Plant Conservation Conference, and the states in the Southeast are on fire, just in terms of not burning literally, but in terms of doing plant conservation, a number of them are incorporating plants into their swaps. So I think we're gonna see the tide turning. I think a lot of it is gonna happen state by state. There are fish and wildlife agencies that are forward thinking and there are others that are not. And I think we're gonna see as more and more states incorporate plants into their swaps, the ones that are not forward thinking are gonna be in the minority and they're either going to, you know, dig their heels in the sand and in the dirt and stay there, or they're gonna come along with everybody else. But I, I do think my takeaway from my dialogue with these groups is that a top-down approach is not going to work that it's going to have to be state by state and it's going to we're going to need loud voices advocating for plants and whole ecosystem conservation within the states and getting the fish and wildlife agencies to pay attention not just to us but to the science behind it that says if you only focus on your species or your group we're going to lose it all and i i think that 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 that's compelling um anyway so I'm, I'm just thinking about homeowners right now and, you know, I walk through my neighborhood and it's all, all lawns, yeah. you know, um, I, I'm, I'm guilty as charged too. I, I have a big lawn because I want some place for my kids to be able to play and the idea of switching over to expanding and reducing the lawn and adding a lot more native plants, part of it I think is financial that uh, it costs a lot of money to to tear up that lawn and plant native plants um, to do the soils and and buy those plants you know it'd be absolutely wonderful if there was some sort of bill in congress or whatever that that sort of made it more affordable for homeowners to to make that switch you know whether it's tax deductible work or uh, you know i'm just trying to think like so how can we push homeowners to make that so it's work and it's money. It's not just about planting columbines and, per and right. trilliums. It's about planting shrubs mm -hmm. and trees and subcanopy and canopy and getting just getting rid of the lawn. It's, and a lot of cities and towns actually in the spring on Arbor Day or whenever it is mm -hmm. actually have free giveaways of, of trees and plants. Mm -hmm. And so that's an opportunity. And a lot of my town, Tacoma Park, has an arborist. Not that the arborist is all that good, but there's an opportunity to to educate people about even caring for the trees that are there. Mm -hmm. Most people have no idea how to care for trees. This is a pet peeve of mine in part because my, my brother's a plant pathologist that works on um, tree disease. And most people just don't have a clue. And we're seeing this massive decline of oaks, especially in the mid Atlantic because of drought and then, mm -hmm. you know, one pest after another, the ambrosia beetles now is a huge problem. And um, so, um, there needs to be an investment, not just in sort of that sort of conservation, but also at the city, town and state level, there needs to be as much outreach as possible about how we care for our existing trees, mm -hmm. our existing tree, our sub canopies, 
um, as well as, and that might be watering, as well as promotion and incentives to get mm -hmm. people to think more broadly about what it means to have a yard that is, it's something you take care of. This is right. your national park. Mm -hmm. This is your own patch yeah. of national park. Do you want, and there's a, turns out there's a park in your neighborhood. Use that for your kids and your, and your, mm -hmm. not everyone needs to have their own place. I, I mean, I, I have a very small, I, mm -hmm. I'm reducing mine more and more, yes. but there are typically parks and I'm not saying there should be open space. There is open space, but if we thought more carefully about the residential patchwork mm -hmm. and we tried to make that more continuous, mm -hmm. that it's appropriate for that specific region, yeah. I think we could really make a major significant major change priority. to not just the plant community, mm -hmm. but to the animal community that is entirely dependent mm -hmm. on that plant community. Right. And it's just a mindset change. It's so a mindset change. Somehow we got to reach the yeah. public with that. It's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. but it could happen in 20 years. And 20 years goes like that. There's another question here from John Vickery. You want me to read it? Uh, no, I can see it. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if there's an annotated bibliography of studies of native versus non-native plants with respect to arthropod diversity and abundance. Um, I think, I'm sure Doug Tallamy has something. Um, the guy, he just, Doug just came out with another book that I haven't read yet. Bring Nature Home. No, so that's his first book. Okay. He just came out with another book that's yeah. actually a New York Times bestseller here about doing something for conservation that involves plants and insects. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a specific answer to you, but if you reach out to Doug Tallamy or you get his book or go to his website at University of Delaware, I'm pretty sure there is a list that's there that you can use. Thanks for your question. There's, there aren't any others on the chat. I noticed some people have unmuted themselves. I don't know if that means that they're patiently waiting okay. to get yes. a word in edgewise or not. Anybody on the line have questions they want to ask out loud? I'll just make one other comment while we wait. Um, so I, I know with insects, one, one thing that, that is driving home the message, because people don't realize how insect loss is, is, is pretty prevalent, that that there's the whole windshield effect yeah. that, that used to be able to go on long distance drives and you get so many dead insects on your windshield and, and you don't have that anymore. I, I, I really have to clean my windshield for, for dead insects. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it, but with birds too, bird poop. I don't see that much bird poop on my windshield as much as as in the past. And I don't have questions, just the yeah. observation. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would help if there were some trees in a parking lot when you park somewhere, but, and you might get some poop on your car. Exactly. You know? but, but but it's just an observation that, that yeah, yeah, you just see in many different aspects that decline that, that, um, that you know if you're not a bird the absence of yeah the, the absence of something that even if you're not a bird watcher it, it's so from our grandparents to today mm -hmm. we've gone from two billion people to almost eight billion people on the planet mm -hmm. um, there's going to be consequences of that yeah. and these are the consequences there's just only so much space mm -hmm. we have to produce a lot more food uh, things are just not getting better from a biodiversity perspective mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately and if we don't start taking more drastic things, we're going to continue to watch these things slide. Yeah. And fundamental to that is making sure people care about this and understand why these things are relevant. Yeah. And that's a big challenge. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There is another question from Margaret Wagner. Do you have any thoughts or tips for land managers doing conversion of non-native monocultures to native plant communities regarding timing, mechanical techniques, or specific herbicides? Um, I don't have any specific recommendations. Um, don't do what I do. I'm a, I'm a gardener at home and I just, it's a constant battle of moving things around and going out and rebuying things and not spending enough time watering. Um, so I, I don't, it's, it's something I, I battle with myself. Uh, so I don't know if anyone else has any recommendations for that. Yeah, so this is Patricia. I have some thoughts. Um, there's there's no one answer at the moment, but there's definitely movements um, in various regions. The first one I'll mention is, um, in, I live in Virginia, and there's a, an amazing program called Plant Virginia Natives. 
And what they've done is um, completely without any interaction with me, so somehow they thought of this on their own, um, they actually have divided Virginia up into regions, that makes sense, and they have developed an entire cadre of materials for people to know what to plant, when to plant, how to plant, where to get it, hmm. when to, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and it's, I think right now there's maybe three or four of them. So I'm in the region of Plant Nova natives, but there's Plant Piedmont natives, and I can't remember the other ones. And it's really awesome because every single one of their, all of their materials does all the work that you need. And I'm just so excited that, that, that they, they know that. And of course they know that. It's, it's just that it's such a complicated thing for the common person to understand. Well, they don't get why they can't find it at Home Depot or at the local mm -hmm. nursery. And that really there's some parts of our country are very lucky. I would say the, the upper, the Great Lakes region, very like Prairie region, they have valued their natives for a long time now. Mm -hmm. They do have their own self-sustaining sustaining native plant industry that, and landowners want to plant natives. Yeah. And even where Kathy is, I would have argued that PNW has been pretty, at, Pacific Northwest has been ahead of the game there too. Um, but so plant note, now it's like, it's a locally based um, activity that includes our native plant society, but it includes the Department of Environmental Quality. So it includes some state agencies, um, some county level work. And that's what it is, that's what you need. Um, I'll, I'm gonna actually ask Anne to comment on something as well. But first I wanna say that I think one of the things I know we're missing in our community is there is no such thing as extension in my community. Um, so mm -hmm. we're, that's where the role comes in for these plant Nova, Nova natives people because um, we have an arborist sort of, but we're kind of not really a town where I live, you know? So there's like all these weird local level problems that means that we don't have an obvious place to go. Um, I think it's also an issue of aesthetics and trying to unlearn the 1950s white picket fence green cut lawn yep. aesthetic, which I was just in a neighborhood the other day that was all manicured. And for a brief moment, I thought, wow, this is really cool. Cause I haven't been in any, <laughs> usually where I am there's kudzu and other stuff going on, but, mm -hmm. um, but that's not, you know, I, I have azaleas in my front yard, even though I don't like them because I think they look like toilet paper after they have bloomed but they're native. And mm -hmm. so darn it, they can live in my yard, you know? Um, but I was gonna ask Anne if she might wanna mention something about the plant agents work yeah. and how it's a whole, it's another sector that I think is a really important um, opportunity. Sure, so um, about a year and a half ago uh, at a PCA meeting, we had this panel discussion with Doug Tallamy, um, the National Water Wildlife Federation, National Audubon Society, and who else? Was there? Um, some folks from the um, uh, landscape architects um, uh, world. community world, yeah. yeah. Um, and over the last year and a half, what has emerged is this dedicated group of people. We're trying to launch what's what's called Plant Agents. We have a website now, plantagents.org, um, and we're trying to find um, through computer programming. Uh, national um, model for figuring out which native plants are suitable for where you live, um, where to find them, and how to design them so they're aesthetically pleasing. Um, and so we're taking, and um, so that they support wildlife as well. So we're taking a number of different national level data sets. Right now we're working on a proof of concept for the Birmingham area, Birmingham, Alabama. And we're trying to scale down um, that national level data to see how well um, it works for a specific area. And so the idea is that it could be the engine behind some of these national databases like, you know, native plant finder for birds or um, that sort of thing. Um, but it could also be used in areas um, that don't have a 
Plant Virginia Natives Program or, uh, you know, like Birmingham doesn't have one. So different places in the country that don't have a resource like that. Well, and it's so, a tool for landscape architects yeah. where right now they have tools, but they're not pointing them to the natives. And so this is yeah. what's so exciting to me is to, to create the, to replicate the tools um, that these people need Yep. and would use if they were there so yep. it's it's i'm really excited about that and i mean i've been waiting um to, to really post anything on the listserv and, until mm -hmm. there seems like we should but i'm anytime i think that we feel like we want to get the word out we should do that the, okay. the, the good news with this issue is and I, I say this tentatively is that for the most part it's an education problem right mm -hmm. there is yeah. a financial problem here and there's an aesthetic problem, but you don't have like groups and like with the cat issue. I've got big groups out there that are supported by the pet food industry that are totally anti non, you know, anti peat and anti birds. They're all about cats. With this group, you know, with this stuff, there are groups out there I know that are totally supportive of non native plants and non native things that we have to fight against now. But in general, people are really eager to hear this information mm -hmm. and are eager to make change. Well, I think statistics like some of the ones you've produced that actually, and, and to Vickery's, I can't remember Mr. Vickery's question or a comment about, do we have some annotated list of native versus non-native? Um, we do generally have to scour publications like this in order to find that. So I'm glad that you have that in here. I'm glad that you pointed it out to us. I think we're gonna use that, that metric um, you'll probably see that a lot. And I would encourage you as you continue to do studies um, to make sure that you can give us a little nudge. If you're already, you know, looking at habitats and things, um, putting some of those stats out there really do help us get our point across because we're not doing the work you're doing. Yeah. And so it's really nice when you analyze that data and you can see and put a little bit of that native plant lens on top of it. Yeah, no, I, I recognize that. We that was that, that was published in PNES and that was that was out there, it was in the press. And yes. Really another do I have like two minutes to describe yeah, another part yeah, of that we're, study? We're Desiree did another thing um, that I've been wanting to do for a while. And what we did was we went into exotic yards versus um, native yards and we sprayed uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, a heavy, heavily labeled nitrogen onto a fresh growing non-native plants versus native plants. We basically tracked energy, but with nitrogen as it moved up through the food web and then ultimately sampled insects and sampled birds to see how much we could trace how that nitrogen moved through that food web directly. And what we found was that exactly what you'd predict in those non-native yards, it's essentially a dead end. It stopped at the plants only in, in, because a lot of it, it was on a few of the insects, but not many, but the birds in those communities, no nitrogen. In the communities that had native species, all the insects had nitrogen. So it was obviously infiltrating into that ecosystem, both within the, within the insect ecosystem where you've got producers and predators and the whole thing with the spiders, and then also into the bird community. Mm -hmm. So it moves, so energy flows mm -hmm. in, native, in native ecosystems, energy's a de there's no energy uh, movement in those exotic communities. Are you, are you thinking or do you, do you see any um, move to try to look a little bit more at the pesticide issue from a perspective, from that similar perspective, the impact mm -hmm. of the trophic level um, to the extent you know that a lot of non-natives do tend to require or people who plant non-natives also tend to use more pesticides i think because they use regular lawn care maintenance type yeah they of might stuff. but I, i'm not going to do that i'm i'm already doing i got too many things going Plenty on of, yeah and I, I think i hopefully other people will start to do this sorts of sort of work in people's yards so they'll understand you know part of the reason for doing this in people's yards is not but not just because residential communities are often missed in terms of science, ecology, mm -hmm. but also because that's where you can influence what people do the most by showing it to them in their own yard, right under their nose. So by sampling for, we've done, we've done contaminants, we've done lead mm -hmm. and we've done um, bromelated, uh, bromelated flame retardants in yards uh, and a variety of things to look at and to teach people about how lead doesn't go anywhere in these communities. And actually it's in the birds. Um, when one lead study we did, um, we sampled robins and uh, when Karen, who the, the grad student who was doing the work, sent her blood samples to the Maryland to, to Department of Health, 
they called her immediately and said, you need to get your daughter, Robin American, to the hospital. Oh, gosh. <laughs> her, her lead levels were over 70 parts per mil. Oh, my 10 gosh. parts per mil are the really high levels. Uh, where it's a it's a oh. red flag. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Are there more questions? Yeah, we had a, a couple of comments come in through the chat. Um, Felicia uh, says, I'm curious to know if others and other states have similar programs to our Grow Native education program. It's a program of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We connect homeowners with native plant focused mm -hmm. businesses in, in the lower Midwest. Um, and then she wrote the Virginia pro program sounds similar. And she also wrote in the website is grownative.org. Mm -hmm. um, and then Becky LaBoy um, wrote in about the Barnegat Bay Partnership. I don't know if I'm pronouncing uh -huh. that. In New it, Jersey? In New Jersey. Uh -huh. One of 28 nat national estuary programs. Um, they've developed a great website for New Jersey gardeners called Jersey Friendly Yards, jerseyyards.org. Features a plant database where you can enter the specific conditions of your own yard, and the filter system creates a list of natives that are perfect. Um, there are also lots of other features on the website to help home gardeners design their garden and implement best practices. There's also one called Florida Yards for Florida residents, mm -hmm. and other states are starting their own too. Yeah, and, and I'm glad yeah. to see that. I, I think the one thing that we've seen happen is the, um, the data that informs those, which I'm hoping those are really awesome and have been ground truth with some care, whether mm -hmm. it's the Native Plant Society or the whatever's, whoever the, the people would be there, the aficionados, because for instance, even with one of my favorite databases, the plants database, and you've got Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center who bases their native plant data on that database, that's, it's in a state or it's not in a state. So in the plants database, if it's native to anywhere in Florida, it'll say it's native to Florida. And so when a database draws that data in, it could still be a problem. Right. And in a way, um, that I'm glad that people are even trying to do that. And I, I don't want to discourage them from doing that. But the, my concern is when the plants don't do well and they've spent a lot of money um, and the thing dies, then they're gonna they're gonna be like yeah well forget that I'm going back to my whatever it is mm -hmm. you know um, and I think I'm more concerned about the bad rap you mm -hmm. know that the, that we tend to get because of that and right. there's so many people around the issue that would like to see that fail that would be happy to reconfirm yeah they're they're really tough those natives yeah know? yeah that that challenge is essentially what we're dealing with with plant agents yeah. i mean that's the nut we're trying to crack and it's it's hard it's mm -hmm. it's um yeah but that's why we're doing a proof of concept in a particular place to test the assumptions and figure out what works and what doesn't um yeah so kathy pendergrass says we need our extension people to hear this talk i still get pushback on my recommendations to attempt to use natives wherever possible sometimes especially from the pollinator folks is there some way to hook this speaker into the state extension programs? Um, Are you hookable? <laughs> I'm very, I'm very busy. There's other people that can give this sort of talk. That, you know, I could make recommendations too, like Desiree Narango and mm -hmm. Doug Talame. And if there's a broad opportunity to talk to extension folks uh, more broadly, that would be, that'd be great. Okay. The pollinator folks, I agree. There's, there's. Um, especially around bees, there's a lot of confusion out there that I find native bees versus honeybees and the importance of beehives and what that does. And I, I think there's a huge amount of confusion there. I totally agree um, that people need to remember that honeybees are not native bees and that they're by promoting more and more of these honey or honey hive type things, we're potentially creating huge competition for really important bee pollinators. It's true, but it's an industry thing too. It's an industry, I know, I know, but it's- And it's, it's one it's, of those conversations that I know Gary's very intimately involved with and, and I have been too, but it's one of those things where for, at least for the native plant cause, it's usually um, we tag on to, we're the caboose hopefully mm -hmm. on another issue. Invasive plant problem, after you pull it, what are you going to put in there? You know, um, pollinator problem, well, what do you need kind of thing? And so while I can't stand the fact that we always have to tack our native plants on to the behind of some other thing, um, I think it's a similar thing that's with, with the pollinators where 
there's a whole contingency of 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 power. I, I don't want it, that might not be the right word, but there's a powerful industry involved with the honeybee issue. And sure. I guess what they what they're trying to do is figure out how to harness that. I mean, they are trying to make sure industry continues, right? Um, to harness the let, like not to ostracize them, I think in the conversation. I, I, I get and that, but I trick. also, I also what concerns me is the ignorance that I see. Yeah. Where, where I used to work at the National Zoo, they paint honeybees on the outside of a big building to try to promote honeybee conservation. Yeah. And it's like, just... WTF, do we not understand what's going on? I mean, this, these are non-native species mm -hmm. that, I mean, this is not what we should be promoting right. here. We can use this as an opportunity to promote native pollinators mm -hmm. and native plants. That's what we should be. That's what we should be pushing here. Yeah. Not putting non-native honeybees on the outside of a Smithsonian that's building. A, yeah, that, I mean, and I see, I see yeah. a lot of posters and it drives me crazy. Yeah. But yeah, there's lots of things that drive me crazy. But one thing I wanted to say is from a native plant perspective, it seems like there's a couple things. I'm curious how you guys deal with this. There's the invasive plant issue, mm -hmm. which, you know, things like English ivy or kudzu or a variety of things, aquatic plants, but then there's the promotion of native plants. Mm -hmm. And how do you balance those things? And what are the priorities from your all perspective? Well, I don't, we can't necessarily as, as, I think as federal agencies, which we're trying to get together to promote the use of native plants in restoration activities, for instance, with our national seed strategy for restoration and rehabilitation, and um, that involves the, the, the underpinnings of producers who actually, you know, being able to get the plants. Um, but I think the work that, we, as, as Peggy said, the work that we do in the agencies, um, it's so, if for native plants, it can be so convoluted, it can be masked. And so much of the public doesn't realize that the word wildlife is legally defined as animal. So anything called Recovering America's Wildlife, whatever the heck that thing, the yeah. Nawa or Rawa, Rawa. Mm -hmm. when it says that, that cuts us out. And so um, I have advocated for years, and when, when I become director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, <laughs> I am going to rename it the U.S. Fish and Wild Space Life Service. Um, so that it applies more broadly. But I think just confusions like that, um, because there's sort of a regulatory complexity behind it, um, makes it hard for people to understand when a, an act like that comes forward that it's it's not necessarily going to impact or help us. We still are clamoring to get on the back of that act so we can make sure plants are in there. The like other thing that I think is happening is that there's a lot of confusion with the word invasive, whether it's a native or non-native. And I know that sounds crazy, but in my agency alone, they talk about invasive natives. And I'm like, excuse me, that is not what an invasive, I mean, yes, okay, they might be the species that are coming back quickly, but that's not really what we need to be talking about. And look at what we're doing with the, um, oh, the pinion juniper, you know, out west, and that's made it to the LA Times and the New York Times, and uh, you name it. Um, those are not invasive species, those are native species that evolved in the west, and um, you know, so I don't know if that's what you were getting at, Pete, or not. Um, Things like Russian olive, Japanese barberry, and and kudzu and mm -hmm. a lot of those sorts of things that are out of control and plants too that are out of control totally changing the forest understory in many yeah, places yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know there's there's a whole bunch of them you guys know them better than i do but oriental uh, bittersweet garlic yeah. mustard yeah. exactly garlic yeah. mustard all those yeah. all those yeah. sorts of things that are is there those are real problems for habitats oh, yeah. that are converting habitats so there's and it seems like we need to get a much better handle on this on this this piece of the ecosystem, both from making sure we're re taking care and conserving our native plant species, as well as dealing with the invasive plant problem. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like there's two big fronts here that are an issue. 
and that we need to make sure our various federal agencies, whether it's the Forest Service or other parts of USDA or it's Fish and Wild Service or whatever it happens to be, or Smithsonian or, or the NGOs or the states, the, you know, did you, are joint ventures involved in plants? Um, to some extent, I think joint ventures can get a mind of their own that, that then makes it hard because there's a lot of people playing in those sandboxes too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were just talking about uh, the role of joint ventures in forestry for some of our foresters right. in the Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, but the, I mean, what you're getting at also, bring, that's why recently at a, maybe the January meeting, I mentioned, is it time to renew or remind people about the St. Louis Declaration, which was a bunch of stakeholders got together and, you know, pledged to to have nurseries, you know, make sure nurseries were aware of the invasive species that they're allowing, yeah. you know, onto the lands. But I think it's also a complicated because, for instance, um, to get a plant listed as a noxious weed, which would, that would require the federal, all federal agencies to do something about that weed if it was on their land or land that they manage. Um, if it's something that's already, um, out of control, they're not going to put it on that list. They won't no. do it because it will it, it will require that they do something about sure. it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so and, you know, and so it's them. really interesting sure. um, how regulatory issues will try to 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 conserve themselves, you know, mm -hmm. to save themselves from. Yeah, but I mean, but whole, we've definitely worked on all those aspects. That's why Plant Conservation Alliance had an, it has an alien plant working group. Um, and, you know, we're trying. Yeah. I mean, the whole MBTA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and this whole take idea yeah. has never been enforced because we don't, the Fish and Wildlife Service, other agencies don't have the resources to enforce the take. Right. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But now we're missing 3 billion birds. So, and the same is true for anything. If we enforce the take, Except just the those early. cats need permits. <laughs> those cats need to stay inside. <laughs> I, I think all of this is further complicated by what you brought up in your talk are of these interacting and confounding issues, right? So you know what I see um, in Rock Creek Park that I hike on a regular basis is, you know, deer, um, the effects of deer. We've got non-natives in the understory. Um, and, and sometimes the non-natives are coming from what people plant in the yard and other times it's like lesser celandine, which is ubiquitous and is actually sometimes the park itself is serving as the source of the invasive that is then coming into people's sure, yards. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it gets really hard to manage. I mean, yeah. the, the park now is doing sharpshooting to decrease the the deer abundance but that was very controversial I and mean, oh, it sure. took years to get approved and well, white, we I, did a good job with the white-tailed deer let me just say right yeah. i mean apparently that was rare or threatened it's not, i'm not not listed officially or anything right. but yeah and it's yeah, done a great good. job of coming back so one thing that hasn't been brought up is climate change and, and how climate change is screwing everything up and putting things out of cycle too. And so sometimes these plants are blooming and the pollinators aren't there yet. I'm sure birds might be arriving in places where, where their food isn't available because climate change might be screwing that up. So um, you know, it's just all interacting factors of, of loss of habitat and climate change and invasive species and pesticide use and it all compounds on, on each other. Yeah, I mean, the, the phenological mismatches are, you know, for birds here, we haven't seen it as much um, in North America. There's some, definitely some examples, but I'm guessing with pollinators and plants, there probably mm -hmm. are. There's a lot of examples, yeah. especially out in the Rockies and elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. With that, oh, yeah. yeah. I don't want to say. I do. I mean, I think for me, what it's making me think about is that we, we each have our own perspectives and groups that we work with, but in terms of keeping our eyes on the prize, the ecosystem level approach, and mm -hmm. I am not sure that we're there, that we're doing that, um, and we need to improve. I'm not sure how, but yeah, yeah. 
Well, I don't, uh, in case, else? unless we have one more. Anyone, anyone else questions? have questions online on the phone? There aren't any more on the chat. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay, okay. so I think, um, yeah, thank you so much yeah. for coming to speak to us. Yeah, yeah my pleasure so much. Kathy Pendergrass says, great. Um, thanks to the speaker and the discussion. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, and you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Don't, don't go anywhere yet, folks. We're yeah, going to keep talking, but um, this, this mm -hmm. let's do let's do thank our speaker. And I, I appreciate the input and conversation as well. Should um, we stop recording at this sure. point? Or do we? Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for yeah. coming out. See you, everybody. And